Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy Show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy Show. Whether you look at ancient epics or modern society, patriarchy seems an entrenched fact. So much so that it's tempting to say this is the natural order of things. Sure, there are matriarchies and matrilineal societies, but those are just the exceptions that prove the rule that Papa knows best. It's just in our DNA. Turkish President Erdogan said you cannot put men and women on an equal footing. It is against nature. But is it? Science writer Angela Saini's latest book, The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule, follows science, archaeology, history, and even DNA to find the actual roots of patriarchy. When did it all begin? And she joins us on the show from New York. Angela Saini, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. (laughs) It is such a pleasure to be back on the show. Thank you for having me. I have to confess that for most of us, patriarchy feels so ingrained, whether we support it or resist it, that we do imagine that's always the way things were. How and when did you first suspect that maybe that's not quite true? Well, when I was writing one of my previous books, Inferior, there was a chapter in there looking at male domination, not just in our species, but in other species. And anthropologist after anthropologist would keep saying to me, Patriarchy is not the norm throughout history. It's not even the norm now. There are many matrilineal societies even now that aren't strictly patriarchal. But certainly the further back in history you go, the more social variation you see and the less of these patriarchal institutions. And the question that readers would always raise with me was, if it hasn't always been this way, then why is it this way now? How did we get to this? How did we become so heavily skewed in favour of men? And I really didn't have a good answer to that question. And also, I think in the back of our minds, we do naturalise it. We treat it as this form of oppression that is somehow rooted in our bodies or that has been around forever. And so we assume that when we fight for gender equality, we're doing something new. You mentioned animal kingdom. What evidence is there in terms of male or female domination in animals? I looked at right across animal behaviour. Often when we talk about male domination, for example, in other primates, in monkeys and in apes, what primatologists are doing there is not really describing males dominating females, but males dominating other males. That's what they generally mean when they talk about male domination. So if you take a species like the chimpanzee, for instance, which is one of the two species closest species to us genetically on the evolutionary tree, very close to us. This is a male-dominated species. But even here, females have their own dominance hierarchies. Males have their own dominance hierarchies. And the dominant male, the alpha male, is not always the biggest or the strongest. You know, often we assume that men are on average a little bit bigger and stronger than women, then surely that underpins this imbalance of power. What you see in chimps is that it's not strength or power always. Often it is a chimp's ability to form connections with others, command support from other people. Like basically chimps who are good politicians. (laughs) In a way, yeah, if you want to call it politics, it is politics in a way because it is about alliances. What kind of alliances can you form with those around you? And in fact, that is why the other species closest to us genetically, the bonobo ape, so equally as close to us as chimpanzees, is matriarchal. It's female dominated, not because the females are bigger. In fact, quite the opposite. The males are a little bit bigger than the females. But the females form such strong networks with each other that the males can't move up the hierarchy. So that's an old girls club. (laughs) It's essentially in a way, yeah. And I've seen it for myself. When I've observed bonobos in captivity, I've seen males having been injured by older females. Now, are there examples of in the animal kingdom where they're neither male nor female dominated, that it could be either depending on the one who can build these alliances and connections? 
Well, you see that right throughout the animal kingdom is that these kind of very fixed ideas that a society has to be male or female dominated really don't ring true. There has been a lot more research over the last decade or so that has overturned these very long standing assumptions that, for example, females are not aggressive or they have no agency or they're not interested in sex, for instance. And we have right across the animal kingdom, snakes, primates, birds, right throughout. Now, those myths are being overturned thanks to the observations that animal researchers have come up with, you know, that we can see that women, uh, that females, I should say, have a lot of agency, can very much be aggressive, and that is exercised in much more complex ways than we imagine. Now, when we look at the human world, going back in time gets harder and harder because there's less and less in terms of records. So what is the earliest point that you found where you could look and tell whether this society, depend, you know, based on archaeological remains, whether this society was patriarchal or matriarchal or matrilineal? Well, we do have good archaeological evidence from some very old sites. So the oldest I went to was Chattelhuyuk, which is this 9,000-year-old settlement in southern Anatolia. This is near the Fertile Crescent. And this is a settlement in which thousands of people lived. And yet we see no signs of gender depression. In fact, men and women lived pretty much the same lives. They did the same work. They spent the same amount of time indoors and outdoors. They were buried in the same ways. They ate around the same food. In fact, even the height difference between men and women is very slight in that society. So we can't say that 9,000 years ago, at least in that region, that very broad region, that societies were patriarchal because genuinely right now we don't have the evidence for it. Where we do start to see signs of gender depression in the historical record is much later with the emergence of the first states. So this is in regions like ancient Mesopotamia, within the Fertile Crescent, as these empires and civilizations are developing, those in power obviously have a very strong interest in population. They're deeply concerned about how to have enough people within their states because people can leave. They don't have to follow the rules of this state and they need those people to produce a surplus and to defend the state. So gradually what you see is over many hundreds of years and eventually over many thousands is that those in power start to dictate how families must behave. There's a pressure falling on young women, for instance, to have more children than they might otherwise have. There's pressure falling on young men to be willing to go out and defend the state and die if necessary in wars of conquest and capture. Later in antiquity, for example, in ancient Greece, you see girls being married off younger and younger in order to make sure that they are loyal to their husbands and they will have children as quickly as possible. And again with men, this idea that for you to be a real man, you have to be macho and strong and able to fight. That is something that's expected of you. And is it clear from the very beginning, I mean, this division that men go to fight, women stay at home and bear babies, that was the quote-unquote natural order of things? Or is, did it just come about because women were the only ones capable of having the babies, so they got assigned this role? Of course, it is in no way the natural order of things. We see evidence of women hunters, women warriors right throughout history. Women are very capable of fighting in battle. That's why so many militaries in the world now, of course, admit women not just in behind-the-scenes roles, but also in frontline roles, you know, including in India. But of course, this does become naturalized over time. People start to frame it as natural. that This is your role. This is your job in society, which you get with all forms of oppression, including class and caste. When you talk about the records that you found in Anatolia, one of the things you mentioned that struck me was that you said we find no evidence that there was disparity in terms of treatment of gender. So that's kind of like a negative evidence is the absence of bias. So as an archaeologist, what do people look for in order to see evidence of matriarchy or matrilineal, which are different things, or even a gender neutral society? Well, of course, in Chattelhuyuk, what we have is a society that predates writing or at least known writing. We do have beautiful reliefs on the wall, so these kind of red paintings on the wall. And generally, they are hunting scenes and pictures of vultures eating dead bodies. You can see the heads being detached from bodies by these 
huge vultures. And none of this is gendered. There's no real sense that there are necessarily men doing the hunting or women <laughs> being picked apart by these vultures. So we can't infer very much from that. But what you can tell is from human remains, and this is what archaeologists do, you can tell a lot about how people live from human remains. So for example, you can know what they ate based on what is left inside their bodies and also the size of their bodies, the quality, their nutrition. And often inequality is informed by that kind of evidence because, of course, higher status people eat different kinds of food. And again, with burials, Chattelhuyuk was a society that was clearly interested in its ancestors. People were buried very carefully within their own homes, in platforms under the floors in their homes. And their bodies were sometimes disinterred. So the skulls would be disinterred, sometimes plastered and passed around people. And again, men and women were not buried in different ways, in radically different ways. Another form of evidence that we have is figurines. We have a huge number, an abundance of female-shaped fa figurines from that region at that time, including the seated woman of Chattelhuyuk, which is this incredible figurine. I saw it for myself in one of the museums in Ankara. Here is this figure around this height of my hand, so quite small, but incredibly arresting. This woman sitting completely upright, so her back is completely straight. She has these beautiful rolls of fat spilling out around her. I really do urge people to have a look online. Just look up the seated woman of Chattelhuyuk. These beautiful rolls of fat spinning around around her, these deep indents in her body, which suggests she's an older woman. The sense you get is that it's an older woman. And underneath her outstretched hands, her resting hands, are what look to be two big cats, possibly leopards, looking straight ahead as though she had tamed them. She looks so authoritative, so powerful, that when this figurine was first excavated in the 1960s, people immediately thought that she must be a goddess or some kind of matriarchal figure. Is it there a danger of confirmation bias where people are so anxious to find these alternatives that they read so much into this figure? Because, I mean, if thousands of years from now people found the Statue of Liberty, they might have a very <laughs> yeah. different idea of women's rights in America at that time. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And this is quite a kind of continual theme in my book because I struggle with it myself. I hear what archaeologists are saying. I see what they're writing over time and how that is shaped by their prior assumptions, by the world around them, the limits of their imagination, the boundaries of what they believe is possible in the past. And also, without a doubt, extrapolation. They look at their own societies and they just imagine that people in the past must have lived the same way. If we are patriarchal now, then surely we were even more patriarchal in the past and we must be able to find evidence of it. And if we don't, then those societies must be matriarchal instead. Ignoring, of course, that that isn't the only two ways in which people can live. There is a rainbow of possibilities for how people might have lived in the past. And Chattelhuyuk is a good example of that because all the evidence does not point to matriarchy as such. It points to a society in which genuinely gender really didn't matter very much. What is the earliest evidence you found in terms of archaeology in India? Again, this is difficult because of the problem of interpretation. So, for example, the world's monotheistic religions, Judaism, Islam and Christianity, come very much later in the record. And we have kind of good documentary evidence of those religions because they were well documented. If you look at the Rig Veda, for instance, it is clearly patriarchal in many ways. You know, there is a sun preference. There is right the way through it. There are these ideas about the dominance of men, the importance of men in society. But how do we know that this wasn't a propaganda around this, that this wasn't serving the interests of those in power? Because at the same time, we also have very powerful goddesses within this religion. And we have depictions of gender and sex and family in much more multitudinous ways than we do these days in modern societies. So it is very difficult, I think, just as it is as anywhere in the world, when you're looking at societies that are thousands of years old, in many cases predate the kind of broad documentary evidence that we have, for example, from antiquity onwards, to really say what people were thinking and how they were actually living, not just how they were the elites in society hoped that they would live. It's very difficult to say. But what I think we can be much clearer on is that 
there was a much more expansive way to think about the family, a much more expansive way of thinking what it meant to be a man or a woman, the further you go back into prehistory. Can language give us clues? I, I mean, was there a time or, or is there a culture which had no separate words for gods and goddesses? In antiquity, in, for example, ancient Greece and Rome, there were many different gods and goddesses that didn't fit within the same gendered rules that everyday people were expected to comply to. We have Hermaphroditus, we have Athena, a warrior goddess. You know, we have so many examples of divine beings who did not follow the same rules as everyone in society. And I wonder if that is a reflection, not just of a past in which people thought about these things more broadly, but the ways in which religion or religious spaces can sometimes offer us an opportunity to imagine worlds beyond our own. I opened the book with Kali because, of course, here we have a goddess who is so transgressive, who does not follow any of these ideas about the submissive woman or the woman who stays in her place. She is, she is happily violent, gloriously violent, powerful, strong, and yet at the same time a mother. She's full of these, and I wouldn't call them contradictions. What I would say is that she's transgressive. She fully occupies all these different spaces in which we all occupy. Women are not just one thing. We are so many things, as are men, as are we all non-binary, transgender, all of us. And in fact, I think the way transgender people have been treated culturally is probably a good indication of how rigid gender roles were. I mean, this binary is very much a product of European thought. It really is not universal. You do not see this everywhere. And it was exported through colonialism and empire, this idea that you must fit into one of these boxes. And if you don't, you are betraying society. You are really living outside what is possible. And of course, in India, there has always been an accommodation, not always a comfortable accommodation, but at least an accommodation for the, for the fact that transgender people exist. The question is, how are those people then treated? Like I said, if you build a patriarchal state on the principle that women need to have children and men need to fight, then what do you do with those people who don't fit into those categories neatly? And this isn't just about transgender people then. This is about many of us. Now, in the book, you, you actually look in quite depth at two ends of India, literally, the Nairs of Kerala and the Khasi women of uh, the Khasis of Meghalaya in terms of looking at matrilineal societies, uh, which are not necessarily matriarchal. Um, what, do you, what did you learn from looking at them and the way they've evolved and the pressure that colonialism has placed on them? You know, they're both fascinating and they're not isolated examples. Anthropologists have documented at least 160 matrilineal societies around the world, many, if not most of them, in Asia, Africa and the Americas, uh, and many of them indigenous societies because some of them are thousands of years old. The Kasis in Megalia and the Nairas in Kerala are actually very different societies because one is a more tribal society. The other one was centered around the kingdom of Travancore, this very wealthy, influential society in which people lived in these kind of extended family theravads. The eldest female, eldest woman in the house would be the kind of matriarch of the family. Much kind of sexual freedom by today's standards and this dogged insistence that, you know, women, of course, should be educated and be literate, which is why possibly why Kerala has such high rates of female literacy and education even to this day. And what you see over time is, especially during the 19th and early 20th century, is British colonialists and missionaries feeling appalled at this situation, <laughs> you know, just flabbergasted that women would have this much authority and power and slowly starting to try and take that away through legal rulings in the courts, through telling people that your ways are backwards, that, you know, a matrilineal family is just not the way to live, that fathers should have predominance in their families, not the mothers which was just, you know, the father was peripheral until then. The uncle was important in this matrilineal household, but the father really wasn't. 
Um, so it really changed social norms very gradually. And that kind of drip feeding of being told over generations, your ways of living are not modern enough, that you need to change if you want to be civilized. That has a huge impact on people. And it changes how people live. In the 1990s, there was a piece of research done in which uh, someone went to look at the Taravats and how they were looking in Kerala at that point. And many of them were in disrepair. They had been sold off. These families had been broken up. You know, people had gone their own ways into nuclear families. Matralini had been abolished by then in Kerala legally by the Kerala legislature. And it's only relatively recently that Kerala has started, because, you know, now to be modern is to be gender equal, and not just a gender equal, but a gender neutral. Now that is the modern, that is a way to be modern. Just recently, a number of Kerala schools introduced a gender neutral uniform. But the way that the state framed that was very interesting because they said, we are returning to our traditions, our matrilineal traditions. And what that says, of course, is that tradition is what we make it. Tradition is not necessarily patriarchal. It is how you choose to construct it and how you choose to live. You know, logically, though, matrilineal would make more sense as a tradition, as in how humans might have, you know, once organized themselves, because you actually know who is the mother for sure, as <laughs> yeah. opposed to the father. Yeah, and that's certainly true of other primates. In fact, it's almost unheard of for the father to be kind of the head of a family in other primate societies, a kin relationships, so between intergeneral relationships, intergenerational relationships between children and parents are routinely, consistently organized through mothers, not through fathers. So we are quite unique in that sense. You know, patriarchy is quite bizarre, quite weird, a system in elevating the father as the head of the household. One of the facts you have in the book, Angela, is that studying mitochondrial DNA, which is passed through the female line, we see living people today share a far broader diversity of female ancestors than they do male ancestors. What does that tell us? This is very exciting. And this is closer to my background. I have an engineering degree. I generally write about science. And ancient DNA studies give us a huge insight now. This is a very new technology that gives us a great insight into how people lived in the past because it allows us, number one, to identify the sex of skeletons or human remains, which was quite difficult to do before. But it also allows us to see who was related to each other in a community into the present. So if you can study the genome of someone who lived 7,000 years ago, you can compare their genome to people living today, which is very exciting. So what we know from that is that the very first signs of social tension in the broad region around Europe, and I'm sorry, you know, a lot of this is focused on Europe because this is where a lot of the researchers are. But in Europe, the first signs of social tension you see are not between women and men. It is between men, between possibly higher status men and lower status men. And the reason I say that is because from around 7,000 years ago, we start to see a bottleneck in the Y chromosome. So this is DNA that's passed from father to son over generations, just through the male line. And what you see here is that sometime around 7,000 years ago, far fewer men were having far more children relative to other men. So a small number of men were having the most kids, and a lot of men were either not having any at all or having much fewer. What does that tell you? It's very difficult to know. It could be that a lot of men were dying in wars. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there was a social hierarchy developing, that elite men were having many more children than non-elite men, which is a very present possibility. Like Genghis Khan, for instance, who had uh, reportedly at least dozens of wives, hundreds of concubines, many, many children, and his sons again had that advantage. So they also had very many more children. To the point where today, one in 200 of all men in the world may possibly be able to trace their lineage to Genghis Khan, according to some researchers. <laughs> so that's quite remarkable, really, the kind of reach of that one patriarch. But we don't see that similar contraction on the female line. So uh, through mitochondrial DNA, we don't see fewer women having more children than other women. So you can infer a lot from that. I hesitate to speculate because it is just speculation at this point because we don't know very much. But what it does indicate is some kind of social tension, whether that is war and conflict or social hierarchy developing. So when you say war or conflict, it could be this 
sense, and, and which is also people assume it may have happened in India too, where hordes of men from outside came and swept through, whether it was parts of Europe or parts of the Indian subcontinent, and possibly killed off the men who were already here and fathered children with the women. Oh, that's one possibility. It's been certainly been mooted. Um, I'm sure many listeners will have heard of this Yamnaya hypothesis, this idea that um, at some point in prehistory, there was a huge movement of people out of the Eurasian steppe into Europe, what is now Europe, kind of the Middle East and Asia. And that seeded patriarchy. There is this idea from the late archaeologist Marie Gambutas that this was the advent of patriarchy, this kind of warlike invaders from the Eurasian steppe. Now, there are a few problems with this. Number one is that we don't see huge changes in how people lived with that movement. It happens much more slowly. And also we know from genetic evidence that patri societies in parts of the Mediterranean, for instance, became patriarchal even without a huge influx of people coming in. So neighboring societies, one would still be fairly kind of female focused or quite peaceful and egalitarian. The other one would be much more warlike. And yet the genetic data shows us that the people in these two societies are pretty much the same. You know, they're all very similar to each other genetically. So all the same kind of relatedness to each other. So I think a much more likely scenario is that, as we know now, social change is carried on lots of different winds. And one of those is migration, possibly, but it's also just cultural change. You know, new ideas come in, people with new technologies come in, people with more power come in and they introduce people to new ideas or their new systems. And then that becomes a uh, part of how people live. It changes culturally how they think about themselves in the same way as happened with the Nairas in Kerala. It wasn't that the British came and took over Kerala in terms of population. They didn't need to do that. They just bought their culture and their ideas and their politics. And that's how they changed society. And I think it's much more reasonable to assume that as well as migration, as well as invasion, a uh, cultural change happened that way. But it's much less sexy. We want that one <laughs> turning point where you say like, oh my God, this is the moment when the goddesses were toppled and the gods were erected. I wish that history worked that way. It would make my life a lot better. <laughs> you know, I would have loved there to be some one moment. I desperately looked for it. But, you know, sadly, it doesn't work that way. Human change just doesn't work that way. And is there evidence, Angela, that even when we talk about the invaders coming in, that the invaders were all men? No, they wouldn't have been all men. <laughs> there were women there. And in fact, some of the earliest evidence we have of women warriors are from the Eurasian steppe, so that we have burials of females with all the implements of war, all the paraphernalia of war. So we do have women warriors from that period of time. And from when do you start seeing the the stereotypes that we start presupposing feminine and masculinity to mean certain things, nurturing versus dominating, or that women are selfless. These things, are they coming out of European philosophers? No, they come out of those first early states. That's where you start to see the shoots of them, at least. And really, they reach a zenith in antiquity in societies like ancient Athens, which was incredibly influential also in neighboring regions, including in India, in the way that people imagined themselves and the way that they lived. So in ancient Athens, of course, we have a deeply misogynistic society, one that was the very first to nurture this idea that a woman's place is in the home, in the oikos, and a man's place is in public, polis. Which makes sense because you need a certain degree of wealth to have separate spheres. Until then, people would have li all lived together in a very communal way. You would have to. But when you start to get large degrees of wealth, elites emerging, then upper class women start to be expected to stay indoors, veiled, covered up, hidden away, invisible almost. Whereas men are expected to be much more visible. And of course, if the upper classes are behaving that way, then that becomes an aspirational goal for everybody else. But is there evidence that there was resistance in the upper class to that veiling? Or were people happy to take it as a, because it became aspirational, you were happy to be indoors and, you know, be the mistress of that domain because you had other people under you? Do we run headlong for our chains? I can't believe that. Because we have evidence throughout, even from the beginning, of people resisting, of always pushing back, of people negotiating within marriages, of going to the courts and arguing their case and asking for more, of 
women who are more independent, who are working for themselves, being treated as suspicious somehow. Why are they suspicious? Because they're demanding their own ways of living. So those tensions, which are palpable in Athenian society, so much ancient Greek literature is about the fear of women rising up and taking over, of women killing their husbands. Of you know, So much of it is about the powerful women, not least, I mean, the legend of the Amazons, this idea that there is a race of women who are just more powerful than men. And what that tells us is there was always a fear this anxiety that this is not a stable system. This is something we have created artificially that we are imposing on people against their will. And we have to somehow keep reasserting, keep reimposing in order to make it real. People ask me, when are the origins of patriarchy then? We are living within the origins right now because we are still recreating those systems even today. And so when European philosophers, for example, think that women were closer to nature whereas men were more capable of taming nature, which of course makes you think like, then why is it the natural order of things for, for patriarchy, you know, for patriarchy yeah. to be the natural order of things? But does that also lead us into other stereotypes? Like, are we falling into the same trap when we well-meaningly look at countries, say, during the COVID crisis with women in charge and say, oh, look, countries like Germany and New Zealand are dealing better with COVID because oh, women are more selfless and nurturing. Yeah, we do still have that problem. And a lot of this is self-serving, of course. European philosophers like Rousseau, who look to ancient Greek society as somehow some kind of natural, perfect society in which everybody knew their place, they weren't acknowledging how tense it really was, how unstable it actually felt to be living there and how constricting the people within it felt, men and women, how much of an imposition that put on them. Why, you know, do so many of them begin their democracies on the principle that women shouldn't have the vote? Because that's what ancient Athens did. And it served them because then the men would have more power than everybody else. The danger, of course, as you say, is that those who are oppressed, those who are kept back, then start to look like the morally superior because they are oppressed. And we see this again and again, that we imagine that women must make better leaders because look how oppressive men have been. We have to be very careful there because every single person is different. I get asked this a lot, especially in the US. People will say to me, wouldn't the world be better off if it were run by women? And I have to say, which women do you mean? Do you mean Margaret Thatcher? Sarah Palin, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Indira Gandhi, some of the most ruthless, hard-headed leaders in history have been women. The problem is we degender them. The only real women leaders are the ones that live up to our stereotypes, like Jacinda Ardern, the ones who are feminine in the way that they lead. And again, the converse, we often don't describe male leaders who are very empathic or nurturing or in touch with their feelings as feminine. Why not? Joe Biden here in the US is actually a very feminine, if you want to use these stereotypes, he's actually quite feminine in the way that he leads. He's very empathic and very nurturing. When you say about Joe Biden being having these feminine qualities, I mean, I think it harks back to the values we ascribe to femininity and masculinity, because, you know, forever a boy being called a sissy was far more negative than a girl being called a tomboy. Well, of course, it, that reflects a power relationship. Uh, to compare someone to someone who has less power then is always going to feel negative and derogatory. It's emasculating. Whereas to compare a girl to someone who has more power in society is obviously going to look better. And that's part of our problem, of course, that within these stereotypes of masculinity and femininity is encoded that power relationship. It serves that power relationship. So, you know, in my dream world, we would be able to relinquish ourselves of these stereotypes, to be able to see individuals as individuals, as every person as unique and not a product of, you know, what sex they happen to be or what gender they happen to be or what color or caste or anything they happen to be. That is the hardest thing for us to be able to do. And I know this as a parent. I have a son. One of the hardest things as a parent is to let your child be themselves. What you want is for them to fit in. And fitting in means following the same old rules that society has followed for generations. You said that when um, people started getting the vote, one of, in most societies, women did not get the vote initially because, it, because that's the way it was in Athens. In general, has democracy been good for women? 
You know, the very first democracy in ancient Athens was very bad for women, <laughs> paradoxically, <laughs> because what it did was prior to democracy in ancient Athens, power was kind of divided between the power within the home and the home was very important. In ancient Athens, the oikos, the home, would have been a center of production. This is where food would have been manufactured. It would have been a busy center of industry within the home and women were in charge of that space. And men were in charge of the polis outside the home. And that sharing of power existed. What democracy did was it took power away from women then. It gave everything to the men in the polis. Not all men, only free men of a certain class with a certain degree of wealth. And it took power away from everybody else. And essentially, that's what democracy has done in modern states too, is that in denying women the vote and slaves and people with not enough land at the beginning, it emancipated some people it enfranchised some people and it took political power away from others. And of course, now, as you say, that political power is balanced out to some degree. But I think many of our laws and customs are still shot through with the same power imbalances that we had before. So for example, the, the example I often give is domestic work. We still do not pay, society does not pay people to do work and childcare within their own homes. Why is that? Why do we pay certain kinds of work and not others? Once we get to the more modern world, any steps towards gender equality seem to have had to come in the form of things like the Russian Revolution or the, you know, like dramatic steps or a Kamal Ataturk coming in Turkey or even the Shah of Iran saying, like, I will modernize everything within the first few years. What has been the result of that? Because it seems those also are much more prone to being rolled back. Yeah, well, we have two options here uh, in order to push towards a society that we want. Now that universally we recognize we are all equal, we recognize this idea of human rights, how then do we create that equal society? And one option, of course, is reform. So you slowly change the laws, change how people think over many generations. And the other is revolution. And sadly, revolutions, at least within the last couple of centuries, have not always turned out <laughs> to deliver the better society or more equal society that people want. One of the examples I give in the book, of course, is the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, which really was, in modern times at least, the first whole-scale event to smash the patriarchy, this big attempt to change gender relations within a generation, and really did achieve so much. The Soviet Union was the first country to legalize abortion. That was in 1920. It opened up higher education, education and work for women, hugely I mean, women were expected to work. It wasn't that you had a choice, you had to work. In some Soviet states, they were given very cheap childcare or free childcare. In Hungary, once it became a Soviet state, if you lived in the cities, there would be laundries where you could take your linens and they would clean them for you. You could eat in the canteens at, in the factories and at work and people didn't have to cook in the evenings because they would just eat their main meal there and then make a sandwich in the evening. And there is still in Central and Eastern Europe to this day, even after the fall of the Berlin Wall, this norm that women should work. But of course, one of the reasons it failed is because what we do when we revolt, when we change everything, is we challenge not just the bits of life that we don't like, like inequality. We're also challenging religion, custom, tradition, the things that we're used to. And that is incredibly hard for people to accept. Of course, you know, we all nominally say we'd love to live in an equal society. But if I said to you, you can have that equal society, but you have to completely rethink the nuclear family, marriage. You have to completely rethink religion, possibly abolish religion, or at least reversion it. The community has to look completely different. Work, the way you get paid, your standard of living, all of that will have to change. Are you still in favour of equality? That's where it becomes tough. And that's a reality of it. I'm just going by not data, but visual images from Soviet days. While, yes, there were a lot of women in the workforce, my image of, say, the Politburo is largely old men. And so in that sense, is it also a problem when that sort of gender equality becomes sort of a gift from the Politburo or a gift from the Shah of Iran? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is exactly what it is, that you take one patriarchy, you try to overthrow it, but then you end up with just another kind of patriarchy. Because, you know, these hard-grained ideas about who we are take much longer to shift. And that was certainly true in the Soviet Union, that as much as the leaders of the revolution 
people like Lenin were very much in favor of women's rights, of liberating women. Yet even to the end, in, even into the 1980s, the Communist Party was largely men, was largely run by men. There was still this hesitation, partly because of the population question. You still need women to have kids. You still need to keep your population up. But also because of these stereotypes about what women really can do. Do we really trust them with this much power? Do we really trust them to run things? So, but why has it proved so easy to roll back some of this equality when men and women get used to working side by side, at least for a while? And then over the years, whether it's in Europe or in Iran, it feels like it's fairly easy that you can roll back gender equality relatively fast in the name of tradition. Now, granted that very often it's a very oppressive system otherwise that is being overthrown. And is gender equality sort of collateral damage there? It can be. I mean, you know, the revolutions we're talking about in Iran and in the Soviet Union, they weren't resting on the principle of gender equality. They weren't gender equality revolutions. They were class revolutions. So in Iran, for instance, in 1979, they wanted to see end, end the monarchy, number one. That was the goal. Women were part of it. Socialists were part of it. Um, but how did that country then end up with an even more conservative one than it had before? How did it end up with the Islamic Republic? And part of that is because the Shah, while he was a patriarch, without a doubt, what he had done was try to modernize the country through his links with the West. So he had formed these very strong links with foreign governments, Western governments, that people felt were betraying the country, that he was kind of selling Iran to Western powers, and Iran was losing its sense of self, that in telling women they couldn't wear the headscarf anymore, telling people, you know, you have to be modern, and to be modern is to be Western, that really rankled. <laughs> A lot of people were not comfortable with that. And so when the revolution happened, and there were very few political options because he had quashed so much of the opposition. All that was really left were the conservatives, were the religious conservatives. When Khomeini came into power, then on this platform of we will return to what we were, you know, an idea of Iran that is much more authentic. What did that really mean? It meant something patriarchal. It wasn't a monarchy anymore, but it was more patriarchal than before because that was seen to be more authentic. It didn't have to be that way. But it suited those in power to construct it that way. And that is why now, in 2023, the symbol of liberation in Iran is taking off your headscarf. During 1979, a symbol of liberation against the Shah was putting on a veil, and now it is taking it off. But the irony, Angela, is that while people could try and paint people struggling for gender equality as being sort of brainwashed by the West. I mean, a country like America was well, had to reconcile its embrace of individualism at the same time as encouraging women to be good suburban housewives. Yeah. <laughs> but there are a lot of contradictions in the West, and the West certainly does not have the kind of monopoly on gender equality at all. It is not even the birthplace of gender equality. We have many egalitarian, matrilineal, matrilocal societies that far predate the European modern states by a long, long way. And in fact, if you look at the European states and when they were founded, like I say, democracies that denied women the vote, that treated wives as property, that wouldn't even allow a wife the right to her children if she left her husband. These are deeply patriarchal societies. And I find it so hypocritical now that the West preaches to the rest of the world about gender equality, when actually it exported its version of patriarchy to many parts of the world that had never seen it before. And one of the things that is striking to me when you look at the situation right now, I mean, we're talking at a time when Turkey has just re-elected Erdogan, who has said that you cannot put men and women on an equal footing, that it is against nature. It seems that even if it's not like all the evidence to the contrary, there's obviously a lot more women who buy into Erdogan's vision of their roles in the world. Yeah, and this is an interesting thing. And I do, you know, it, this is the hardest thing to write about as someone who, I am a science writer, number one, but I'm also a feminist. And I would like to believe that there is a sense of solidarity between all women in the world, but there really isn't. And the reason for that is that 
gender equality is not the most important thing to all women at all times. We have different things that we are also committed to, different loyalties. They may be to our religion, which may be patriarchal. They may be to our class, which may be very hierarchical. Maybe to our caste, which is very exclusive. There are so many different things from which we source our own individual status and power. And that is important to remember wherever in the world we see women, to our eyes at least, or at least to a kind of objective observer, seeming to so-called betray their own sex. They are not betraying. What they are doing is working in a way that benefits them in another way. Whether it is through race or ethnicity or caste or class, they are finding their power in a different way for themselves as individuals. And this is something we really need to understand because how else do we explain the persistence of a system that oppresses more than half of people? I'm not saying it's achieved with the complicity of women. I'm just saying it's achieved because systems of patriarchy have woven their way into so many other things to which we are also committed including systems of marriage, including how the family works, in very sometimes quite anodyne ways. You know, how many times have people seen their mother doing more housework than their father and not said anything because to them it feels like that's just tradition, that's just custom, that's how they live. That is patriarchy. When a woman takes her husband's surname, that is patriarchy. That is a practice rooted in slavery that borrowed from the institution of slavery. And yet I know so many women within my own family who have done that because it feels like custom or tradition. We have to be able to question everything and ask ourselves, gender equality is not just about making things better for women. It is about ending all forms of oppression. Because as long as one group is able to be oppressed, then any group is able to be oppressed. Recently, we had somebody on the show who was talking about the fact that in India, the number of women in higher education has increased. But the number of women who are employed, in the percentage of women in the labor force, that has gone down. And, uh, you know, people are trying to figure out the reasons for that. And one of the things they're saying is that sometimes, you know, education has become more of a priority because in a marriage market, it actually counts for more than it did before. And then she also anecdotally has talked to women who have gone into higher education as a way to put off marriage. Right. Well, of course, these are two different things. Education doesn't always lead to employment. It's not always even designed to lead to employment. I know women myself, even here in the UK, who have gone to university with the express purpose of getting married and becoming a housewife at the end of it. And that is a choice, you know, the women in our society are entitled to make. But we also have to look at the other side of the equation. What are the barriers to entry into work for women that also lead to those statistics? I don't think it's always a choice. There are many employers, I think, are still favorable to men when it comes to hiring. People are suspicious of hiring women because they may get married and have children and then they drop out at some point, which I do think paternity leave would settle to some degree if men and women shared the burden of childcare and, you know, leave after having children equally, then I think that would be less of a, an issue for employers. And then there, are, there is the profound impact of abuse, harassment, discrimination that forces women out of work. There's a book coming out just now, actually, Lab Hopping by Ashima Dogra and Nandita Jairaj, which looks at women, transgender, non-binary scientists in India. And again and again, the stories you hear from them are of not being taken seriously, even if they're better than their peers, than their colleagues, of experience abuse and harassment, being driven out of work that they love because the conditions are so bad, because they're being treated so badly. In the end, does it matter if there was a more diverse past or not, a more matriarchal, matrilineal past or not? Because one could also say that even if there was not, even if it was patriarchy from get-go, that still should not stop us from aspiring to gender equality now. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, again, one of the things I grappled with is why do we need evidence of a different past? Why do we search for utopia <laughs> elsewhere in history or in geography and elsewhere in the world in order to believe that we ourselves are capable of change? We shouldn't need that. We should be able to do it ourselves. But I think coming back to the very first question you put, the fact that we naturalize patriarchy is what holds us back. When we have proof, evidence 
And you know, this is my job as a science writer to look at the evidence. When we have that evidence that we can live in different ways, it frees us from being constrained by this biological argument that an alternative is impossible. Then it allows us to imagine different worlds. And really, that, that is why I see this book as a hopeful one. I don't see it. It's not one of those feminist books which you read and just say, oh, look how bad things are for women. I would hope it's one of those books that you read and think, we can really change this. Anything is possible. We can live however we want. There is nothing constraining us. It is really just about the choices we make and how good a case we can make for the rest of our society, for the world that we want to live in. You know, there are three useful tools for those in power. One of them is history, one of them is religion, and the other one is nature, this idea of the biological. So, you know, my job really as a journalist has always been to interrogate each of those and ask how is it that you are pulling those levers to make it look as though history or religion or biology is in your favor. And as a scientist looking at the evidence that's out there in the world right now at the results of elections, are you hopeful you know, I've come to the realization that social conflict is part of human nature. It's not as though we will magically land on some perfect society one day and then everybody will live in peace forever after that. This is something every single person wants power, wants status, they care about it. And what we see throughout history is a patchwork of those desires. Some people succeeding, some people not succeeding. Um, and we are the inequality is a product of that. So if we want a better society, we can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. It's not going to happen magically by itself. We have to make the case for it. We have to fight for it. And within this conflict, within this social conflict, make a space for alternatives. The alternative I would like to see is one in which we learn to love each other and support each other, in which we rail against the patriarchal state, not by saying men are bad <laughs> or that, you know, women should be running the world, but by saying, how can we repair the relationship between children and their parents, which has been so damaged by these expectations that the patriarchal state places on us, repair the damage between partners in marriage or whatever your family relationship is. How can we learn to love each other again and support each other again and build societies in which we care rather than in which all we are trying to do is make life better for us as individuals? That is the world that I would love to see that would be a truly anti-patriarchal one. Angela Saini, from your word, what did it say? From your lips to God's ears <laughs> or the goddess's ears. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And apologies again to you and to the listeners for my, the quality of my voice right now. I lost my voice last week. It was a very androgynous voice. I think it was perfect for this <laughs> well, show. Well, then I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> Science writer Angela Saini's latest book is The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule. In our book, you rule. So send us your thoughts about this show wherever you get your podcast from. Find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Express Podcasts. Thanks as always for listening. This show was produced by Shashank Bhargav and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio. <laughs>